Hello, my name is Max Nicotra, Technical Marketing in the America region for Teseo modules. Today I'm giving a refresher and update on STGNSS module family, Teseo Lib3, for the industrial IoT positioning applications. I will introduce the STGNSS Vic3 family of GNSS positioning modules and some of their many features that make them a great fit for mobility applications. After that, my colleague, Mike Slade, we we'll provide an overview of our Tazeo debt reckoning bra drum solutions. And the last but not least, Buzz Memo, CEO of NevMedic, will present their Tazeo Live 3F based e mobility solution and performance. Before getting into the Live 3 module details, I want to give an overview of the Tazeo 3 chipset architecture and features, given that the Tazeo 3 chipset is the heart of Live 3 and Big 3 modules. So what is the Zeo? The Zeo is a GNSS chipset family that leverages simultaneous multi-constellations to provide world-class GNSS receiver performance for the numerous location-aware applications. And it is automatic rate certified. The Zeo 3 is a SOC, a single band L1 multi-constellation that integrates considerable hardware fun functionality. As you can see in this chip, block diagram. Starting from upper right, going counterclockwise, satellite signals come into the green block, which is the RF interface, which down converts the GPS satellites, 1.5 gigahertz signals to IF, 4 megahertz, which, has, which um, ADC samples and converts to three bits signal of magnitude data with AGC, automatic gain control, this data is sent to the white block or baseband DSP colorator engine, which does an early late type of correlation on the baseband, baseband signal and magnitude data to perform low level acquisition and tracking. These correlation result and decoded navigation data are passed to the R9 core for position computation and uses the 256K on chip RAM. Let's dive into the Live 3 module family overview. So the Zeo Live 3 GNSS module family is available in two flavors, the Zeo Live 3F and the Zeo Live 3R. The Zeo Live 3F and the Zeo Live 3R modules embed the Zeo 3, which supports simultaneous three constellations, GPS and Galileo, and either GLONASS or Beidou. They also support SBAS. The Zeolib 3F and the Zeolib 3R are the first member, members of the Zeolib module family, enabling faster time to market with the same great performance and many features of the Zeo chipset. The Zeolib 3F is our best in class multi constellation Genesis module with outstanding accuracy for IoT ecosystems, good tracking fleet management application, and et cetera. The Zeo Live 3F and the Zeo Live 3R are intended only for industrial, consumer, and IoT applications. In the center is the, sorry, in the center is the module silhouette of So sorry, in the center is this is module silhouettes. On the left is the list of the key features, and on the right, the corresponding benefits. The multi-constellation with um, increases the availability, redundancy, improves the tracking in a certain environment is often the case in urban or foliated areas, and improves the special distribution of visible satellites, resulting in improved dilution of precision, or DOP is beneficial to have a best-in-class accuracy. There are several versatile low-power mode, modes, allow tailoring Genesis usage to application-specific needs and power budget, assist Genesis to reduce the time to first fix, preload the functions, geofencing, odometer, data logging, are useful basic function for certain IoT applications, for example, people and pet trackers, fleet trackers, and insurance trackers. Pre-certified RF modules 
LIF3 modules are compliant with several RF certifications to reduce design risks, costs, and time. And LIF3F executes firmware out of flash, which has two big benefits. The first, it enables firmware configuration changes to modify and expand the end product's capability. And second, it enables firmware com upgrades throughout the product's life cycle to improve performance and extend product longevity. Obviously, Live3R does not support all flash-based features. So both the Live3F and Live3R are a tiny little chip carrier or LCC 18-pin package. The module have three supply voltage lines, VCC, VCC IO, and VBAT at 3.3 volt. And the image below stated shows the Live3F architecture. In the center is the Tezeo chip, upper left 26 megahertz TC oscillator for fast time to first fix, 32 kilohertz RTC for maintaining accurate time, and upper right 60 megabit embedded flash for software execution and data storage. Reset and wake up inputs from host, PPS output to host, and UART I2C slave communication interfaces to host. Live3R has the same architecture as Live3F, but the flash. The modules allow to get a very simple design with a minimal BOM, so filter is optional, but recommended for design with collocated communication ICs, and the LNA is optional, but recommended for passive antenna designs. And the Live3F hardware user manual, which is available on st.com, provides complete information to support your design. Here are the evaluation boards. Uh, the X Nucleo is ideal for STM32 based prototyping with a configurable NMEA message output and command input over UART or I square C slave communication interfaces. It is available only for LIV3F. EBB LIV3F and EBB LIV3R allow a complete evaluation, including power consumption measurement. All these evaluation board are audible on ST.com and through the distribution. The Zill Suite is a free Windows PC-based GUI tool that is extremely powerful and easy to use. It is possible to view, record, and playback NMEA messages, also for debugging, view graphics such as position, sky view, map view, and carry to noise ratio, send commands, and upgrade and con configure the firmware. Uh, let's dive now into the new GNSS positioning module family for mobility applications. The Zeobic 3D GNSS module family is available in two flavors, the Zeo Big 3 da automotive grade for automotive market, and the Zeo Big 3 d industrial grade for aftermarket. The Zeobic 3DA and the Zeobic 3D are the first two members of the Zeobic module family. They enable faster time to market with the same great performance and many features of the Zeo 3 chipset and support ST draw that reckoning algorithm, which augments, sorry, which augments the positioning accuracy and availability, especially when the GNSS signal is degraded by environmental conditions such as tunnels, urban canyon, indoor parking, and multi-level highways. DRA exploit the integrated ST6 axis IMU, 3D accelerometer, and 3D gyroscope, which is automotive grade certified in Big 3 da Here are the same considerations made previously apply. So, both modules support simultaneous three constellations, GPS and Galileo and either GLONASS or Beidou, 
and support also the SBUS, satellite based augmentation system. Several versatile low power mods allow tailoring Genesis usage to application specific needs and power budgets. Assisted Genesis to reduce time to first fix. And both modules execute firmware out of flash, which has the same two big benefits enables firmware configuration changes to modify and extend the end product's capabilities. And second, it enables the firmware upgrades throughout the product life cycle to improve and extend product longevity. Big modules are tiny, shielded, little less chip carrier or LCC, 24 pin package. The modules have three supply voltages line uh, BCC and BCC IO at 3.3 volt, and VBAT in the range of 2.1 to 4.3 volt. At the C oscillator for fast to time first fix, and at the C oscillator for maintaining accurate time for start fixes are integrated in the modules. The flash memory for software execution and data storage is embedded in the DSL3 chipset. On the right lies the big three pin out. Pin 15, upper left, and pin four, lower right, are the signals relating to the odometer. Pin four, forward vehicle direction input pin, binary value, forward or backward, and polarity is selectable. And pin 15, the will tick, odometer input pin. Big 3D modules make prototyping quick and easy with a minimal BOM. On the left, you find the odometer signals, which are optional but preferred if available. The odometer data can be provided over wire by pin four and pin 15, or yours. In this case, the external host fits the big 3DA with will tick data via NMEA, NMEA input message. So filtered optional, but recommended for the sign we collocated communication ICs and LNA optional, but recommended for passive antenna designs. The big three hardware and software user manuals on our website provide complete information to support your design. A GNSS function is used to avoid cold start after four hours and warm start between, between two and four hours by predicting the position, thus reducing time to first fix from around 30 seconds down to one to four seconds. Uh, these are three, there are three modes. Self-train uh, with computation being done on chip in a background task. The prediction works well if I'm not moving under different satellites. Uh, say 61 miles or 100 kilometer away. The predicted is a lighter computation load due to the around 12 kilobyte packet download via TCP IP. It works everywhere, download ephemeris data typically every 14 days. And the last one, real time, works everywhere, download ephemeris data typically every two hours if I'm not moving more than 61 miles or 100 kilometers away since the last download. Low power mods, uh, adapting, it works in RAM mode. If the GNSS module is tracking several uh, satellites being part of different constellations, it could be possible that the contribution of some of them to the accurate position measurement is marginal or non-existent. In this situation, the system can decide to turn off a constellation of constellations. The estimated horizontal position error, EHPE, is the discriminant parameter. Cycle, it works in run mode. The position is calculated each second. DRF and baseband, baseband are turned off to the 70% of the runtime. Periodic fix. It works in GPS only. After the pre-programmed time, the lift 3F wakes up, calculates the fix, and moves back to standby. The last, last one is the fix on demand. 
It is connected to an external event. For example, let's imagine a system which is supposed to be still an accelerometer connected to an external host, host uh, detects a movement, and the host wakes up the lift tree to recalculate the fix. The module operate using the last save configuration. Um, here are some draw and drum related features. I will let Mike to introduce them during the second part of this presentation. There are three standard preloaded functions, data logging, this memory is part of the flash integrated in the, the ZO3 chipset, which is hosted in the VIC3 module. Geofencing, there are up to eight configurable circles and odometer. It provides info and travel distance, but is not a step counting. The EBB VIC3 DA evaluation board is a complete standalone evaluation platform for the Zeo VIC3 DA and the Zeo VIC3 D that reckoning GNSS module for features evaluation and also for power consumption measurement. To find out more about the, the Zeo GNSS module families, LIV3 and VIC3, as well as get access to pertinent technical documentation at the Zeo Suite, go to www.st.com slash GNSS modules. VIC3D modules will be available in Q1 2021. I recommend you join us in the ST GNSS community to share ideas and ask questions. Thanks for your time. Now I want to hand over to Mike, who will provide an overview of our Tezeo Debt Reckoning Bra Bram solution. Thanks again. Bye. Thank you, Max. Hello, everybody. I am Mike Slade, and I am the technical marketing lead for the ST Tessio Positioning Solutions. And I'm Really excited to be able to share more details about the Tessio Dead Reckoning solution that Max mentioned, which is a core feature of those Tessio VIC modules that we are offering soon to the market, making them really the best fit for all types of mobility and tracking applications. And I actually want to mention that this presentation was primarily generated by my esteemed colleague, Nicola Polella, who leads the navigation systems development team out of our Agrate Italy office. So I'm gonna start it off with a poll question. The first one is, do your products currently leverage GNSS technology? So I'd love to hear from you since the polls and the Q&A at the end are really our only tools to make this a dialogue instead of a monologue. So I would greatly appreciate if you could each take a few seconds to answer the poll. Thank you. So, dead reckoning, commonly referred to simply as DR, perpetuates position, velocity, and attitude when GNSS is either, one, not available, for example, when in tunnels or parking garages or other areas where there's a complete loss of satellite signal, or two, uh, when GNSS is available but not accurate due to reflective or widely obscured environments such as in big cities with a lot of tall buildings as you can see in this picture which we <laughs> unaffectionately refer to as an urban canyon. And that's because really all the medium and low angle signals have trouble directly reaching the street where the user typically is located. So shown in this diagram on the left you see it draw our dead reckoning automotive way, which is a common filter-based algorithm that estimates position, velocity, and attitude using various sensor inputs. So from the top of that left diagram, uh, you'll see going clockwise, those sensors are a gyro for yaw or heading, an odometer for distance traveled, an accelerometer for pitch, temperature, and most most importantly, GNSS, 
which is considered an input because it is used to calibrate the draw algorithm. So we run the draw algorithm directly on our Tessio core, so it is closely coupled with our GNSS Kalman filter algorithm. Then shown in the diagram on the right, you see DRUM, or Dead Reckoning Unplugged Mode, is also a Kalman filter-based algorithm that estimates position, attitude, and velocity using the same sensor inputs as you can see, except one's missing. In the upper right, it's the odometer, hence the namesake unplugged, as it does not require a direct connection to the vehicle. And it is really more a fit for aftermarket applications and various mobility um, specific applications. So DRUM in turn computes distance traveled from linear displacement of the accelerometer. The key to draw and drum performance is the six axis IMU. We highly recommend the STASM 330LHH for best automotive performance or its industrial equivalent for that, which is the ISM 330LHH or the LSM 6DSR. So, Tessio Drum, I want to talk about a little bit more its specific advantages or value add features for navigation, telematics, and mobility. Automatic temperature compensation, or ATC, is what actively compensates for thermal effects to the IMU, guaranteeing long term accuracy. Automatic free mount, or AFM, autonomously determines and accounts for PCB installation of the end product guaranteeing consistent optimal performance independent of how it's mounted in the vehicle. Map match feedback or MMFB allows map data from the end application to be fed back to draw and drum to still improve navigation accuracy more so. Low level interface or LLI enables the solution's position, velocity and attitude and time in fact, that output at a rate of up to 20 Hertz and also an IMU data output at a rate of up to 100 hertz, all with minimum latency and jitter for absolute accuracy. And lastly, not shown here, but also available is sensor over UART. So it is offered for architectures where the IMU is not directly connected to Tessio. Hence the sensor data is gathered by an external processor and sent to Tessio via UART. DRUM performs the same computation and with minimal latency and jitter from that host data, ideally less than 10% of its delay or transmission time, an accurate PVT can be provided. Uh, so this flow diagram is a high level overview of the DRUM fusion filter. It depicts system inputs such as raw GNSS measurement data in the upper left and raw IMU data in the lower right. And the Tessio firmware keeps both the GNSS and IMU data perfectly synchronized. In other words, we have a sensor input data handling and buffering routine that's optimized for minimal latency and jitter, as I mentioned before. And it, what it does is it enables very quick and accurate sensor calibration and ultimately an optimal fused navigation output. On the right, you can see a list of output states and position, velocity, and attitude are the primary output states which represent the dynamic system of interest, which in this case is a vehicle. Um, and then there's some secondary output states that consist of IMU calibration parameters, IMU installation angles, and others not shown. Essentially, the system estimate is driven by the sensor's input in the loop to the right of that diagram in the middle you see. And that from 20 to up to 100 hertz, depending on the actual system needing to be modeled and how, dy and how dynamic that system is, meaning vehicles such as cars are not as highly dynamic as drones. So this system estimate is concurrently being corrected by the left loop, which is the one hertz GNSS fixes. And that's, of course, when, like I said, it's available since GNSS is not always available, like in a tunnel or it's obstructed in a city. So the green boxes you see in this diagram represent the system equation matrices, and K represents the calm and gain matrices, which um, optimally controls the current observations as they vary within specified tolerances or what we call covariance limits. The established 
well-established Kalman theory dictates that the modeling of both sensor measurement noise in the R matrix and process noise in the Q matrix also be taken into account. So the, the crux of the matter is this sensor fusion or Kalman has to be calibrated, has to be calibrated quickly and maintain an accurate state estimate. So from very first power up of an ECU, for example, in a brand new car, the IMU is mounted however the design dictated. And the gravity vector is quickly determined while the vehicle is static and positioned on the road. So that the orientation of the three axes of both the gyro and accelerometer become known with respect to gravity in that vehicle, supporting now the subsequent DR computations. And after some initial driving, uh, course or rough initial calibration is refined for the gyro by executing some turns, which is what helps us dial in the yaw parameters. And for the accelerometer, accelerometer by executing some straight driving and dialing in that accurate linear displacement calculation of distance traveled. So good GNSS is actually required as a reference during this calibration period. But then these common states, like I mentioned, are, are periodically recorded to NBM and, and at power down so that at subsequent power cycles of the vehicle, over the life of the vehicle, the states are extracted from NBM and at every power up and the solution retains that fine, very accurate calibration that's already learned for this vehicle over the life of the vehicle. Guaranteeing that the DR performance doesn't vary um, from time to time. It is consistent and continually improving. So thank you for answering our first poll question. The responses to do your products currently leverage GNSS technology makes me think, um, oh, I apologize, uh, makes me think several are just learning about it. So that's good to know. I'll tailor um, kind of my discussion that some for sure use it for in development or future plans. So uh, it's good to see, it's, it's good to see this is quite an even distribution. So of course, you know, for those of you who are in development or future plans, by all means, um, we'd be glad to discuss in after this uh, with you your requirements and see how we can help you achieve the, the addition of GNSS to your solution. Uh, here is the second and last poll question of the day. And it is, if your product does require GNSS, what are your three requirements? And again, I'd love to hear from you since this question gets more to the heart of what your application needs from GNSS. So just wanted to talk a little bit about the IMU that I mentioned before, the ASM 330LHH, which is a six axis IMU. Um, and it's been designed from the ground up for automotive applications. And it is actually qualified for AEC Q100 with an extended temperature range to positive 105 degrees C. And the navigation accuracy is directly, direct, directly proportional to sensor noise and temperature dependence. So the, so the Allen variance commonly known method is used to characterize low frequency noise, which impacts this navigation accuracy over longer integration periods. And in the lower left, you see the stability features on, uh, listed that show a value of three degrees per hour for bias instability or BI and 0.21 degrees per root hour for angle of random walk or ARW, which if you're not sure how those compare, they are best in class. And in fact, ST is the only uh, manufacturer to publish BI and ARW in our data sheet, which reaffirms our confidence in being best in class. And, and as I mentioned, for industrial designs, by all means, the ISM 330 LHH is a lower cost equivalent solution. So I just wanted now to share a little more real data and this is the first of a couple slides. Um, this is a snapshot of a recent competitive performance comparison in two very different environments. First off on the left is the uh, open sky environment or highways, which typically weight um, GNSS in the fusion solution more heavily because the GNSS signal is so good in, in highway and open sky. The 
many signals are available, there's few reflections. And as you can see, the circular error probable or CEP 50% error is approximately 1.4 meters in this environment. On the right, the second environment is Urban Canyon, which typically weights DR more heavily uh, due to GNSS, multipath reflections and obscuration. It, it has to deweight some of those questionable signals, as I previously mentioned. So the CEP 50% position error is, is greater in this case. It's about two times or approximately three meters, um, two times the open sky that is, due to lower availability of line of sight signals and, and generally weaker signals of GNSS. So our ST drum metrics in the blue bars versus uh, competitors metrics in the pink bars indicates that drum has slightly better performance at CEP50 and significantly better performance when we evaluate one and two signal metrics. This is a snapshot of heavy foliage performance and I apologize it's a bit of an eye chart but we'll, I'll try to direct you. So the upper left plot shows several long sections of heavy foliage where the blue track depicts GNSS only positions and the light yellow between those blue depicts the three sections where GNSS signals are greatly degraded. And so if you look closely at each foliage exit and, and to do that, you need to note that the vehicle is traveling from right to left in that picture. And so from outage one to outage two to outage three, as you can see, the blue GNSS only position shows slightly higher position error for those first few sections after essentially it comes out of the heavy foliage or comes out of those yellow sections. Because once it exits and starts to see those GNSS signals more clearly again, of course, they're quickly being reacquired. But in that brief period, there is a little bit of, or there, I should say there's increased error. But now looking at the lower right plot, which is the same drive test, but it's showing the red, which is actually our fused position with GNSS and drum. And again, moving right to left, of course, you know, through outages one, two, and three, the, the white depicts the drum only track. Um, and in this case, we've switched to pretty much drum only like a tunnel because the heavy foliage is that thick. Um, and again, looking closely at each exit of those one, two, three foliage outage sections, you, you do not see that greatly uh, reduced position error um, because the drum has provided continuous tracking in the presence of weak GNSS signals. So, so there's really not this gross um, error at the exit that demands reacquisition, but instead the drum keeps a continuous position all through the route. So this is an example how drum maintains that continuous low error tracking in all environments as as it's designed to and needs to. So this slide is a chart that shows position accuracy of the drum filter during a complete uh, GNSS outage. Again, it's based off of real field data using the ASM330 LHH 6-axis IMU with actually our TESIO3 solution and is the result of you know, 30 test runs to ensure that there is statistical significance. And the position error is simply expressed as a percent of the distance traveled in a tunnel. The leftmost group of four bars shows one sigma errors for respective outage distances. The middle group is two sigma and the rightmost is three sigma. And as you would expect, the percent error increases for two and three sigma, but only linearly, not, not exponentially confirming that the ASM 330 LHH is excellent performance with drum um, is, is bared out, bore out. And so also you can see that the four kilometer tunnel performance is, is in some cases equivalent to or better than the, the half a kilometer, which confirms that we still have this excellent bias instability and angle of random walk um, regardless of the duration because different tunnels have different durations. So you really want to have as, as good short 
and long-term duration performances you can get. So we are looking at the response now to our second poll question. And it looks like, yeah, cost, <laughs> as always, cost is very important for sure. And, um, and then power consumption. So which makes sense because what we've seen as we, you know, DevCon appeals to more mass market or IoT applications. So a lot of IoT applications are very power, um, concerned with power and cost for sure. And so it looks like performance and size are relatively um, comparable too. So that's, and that's what I would expect, uh, a fairly even balance a lot of times cost and power consumption are, are slightly bigger. So again, um, thank you for taking the time. That helps us to know how to tailor our solutions so that they're the best fit for your application. So again, please do reach out to us after this presentation if you'd like to discuss your GNSS requirements in greater detail. So. Thank you all very much for taking the time to learn more about our Tessio GNSS plus draw and drum solutions. And of course the Live and Vic modules that Max shared. And, and to find out still more about the Tessio chipsets um, modules, draw and drum, or any of our products in that family line, you know, feel free to visit the st.com slash GNSS modules landing page or st.com slash GPS landing page. So next, I would like to introduce Boaz Mamo, the CEO of Navmatic, who is a valued ST partner who is developing solutions for micromobility with various ST products, such as Tessio. Thanks again, bye. Thank you, Mike. Uh, and uh, thank you, Max, for for giving us all this information. I, I personally learned a lot from uh, what you guys presented. Uh, I present, my name is Boaz. I'm the CEO of uh, Navmatic, and uh, we are focusing on high accuracy position uh, for micromobility. Uh, now, if we're talking about uh, micromobility, what is, uh, what is uh, micromobility? Uh, micromobility is the solution of uh, small vehicles that uh, at usual replacing uh, car rides in, uh, in the distance of up to five miles. It's what we all see in our cities, like uh, scooters and, and bikes, at usual electrics. And uh, um, from what we're seeing today, uh, this, the micromobility is a growing market. Um, it's a market that uh, predicted to be like uh, $500 billion in almost 10 years, and even today, we see uh, a huge growth in the sales and in uh, um, in the interest of the um, audience in micromobility. Um, and as much as this industry is uh, um, uh, booming and growing, uh, with the growth, there is also coming a lot of uh, uh, problems. And the problems that uh, those companies are facing, especially the shared mobility, uh, micromobility companies, is around accuracy of position. Because um, first of all, they have a lot of problems with regulators. Uh, a lot of cities like Dallas and Copenhagen banned micromobility from uh, uh, their cities because they don't like the people throwing it and parking it anywhere. And that's caused a lot of problems to the uh, micromobility operators. The second thing is for operation. Um, personally, myself, I started the company because I was trying to find a uh, a scooter and save time by getting uh, my destination in a faster way and found out that I'm wasting more time looking for the scooter rather than to ride on it. Um, but when I worked on the solution, I realized that operators also have a lot of problems uh, to operate uh, the scooters because uh, they need to charge it every night. And their employees who need to find those scooters just can't find them because sometimes they can be a block away from where uh, they can see it on the app. With a uh, more accurate position, uh, those operators uh, uh, find ways to create uh, smart geofencing, uh, have a better rider experience, and also 
uh, been able to operate uh, uh, better their operation. What we in Nomadic did, we developed, we, we looked for develop a, a solution that uh, uh, utilized existing uh, uh, sensors or new sensors that uh, uh, similar to uh, 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 the drum, basically using uh, IMU, uh, speed data and GNSS data uh, uh, to uh, generate uh, a better uh, location. Now the question is, be why, why do you need a uh, special uh, dead reckoning for uh, 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 micro mobility? And the reason is that we found out that uh, um, the physics of a scooter or a bike is very, very different than uh, a car. A car you cannot lift and uh, and switch 180 uh, degrees on the other side. Uh, turns are different. There is so many different aspects uh, between cars and uh, micro mobility, and therefore they're needed to have a better uh, uh, DR dedicated for micro mobility. The other thing that we added is our correction data. We took uh, a correction service and we added it into the GNSS measurements in order to create a better measurements. Uh, when we came into uh, the solution, we realized we need to have, uh, first of all, uh, uh, some kind of uh, uh, EV kit that we wanna uh, test our solution and also share it with our uh, potential customers. And on the high level, the things that we realized we need on, to have on the EV kit uh, we needed an MCU that obviously, uh, because we're aiming for IoT, it needs to have uh, as much of high performances as possible with low power. Uh, we need a GNSS module that uh, is going to be uh, cheap, but will enable us to have access to raw measurements in order to implement the corrections. We need a six axis IMU uh, uh, to make sure that we have the accelerometer, but also the gyroscope, which is super important when you're uh, having a scooter. And we need to have a connector that can enable us to have a wheel tick or speed data to integrate in our uh, uh, solution. And not least, we need to have a, an internet connection in order to send the da our data to the cloud, but also uh, enable us to uh, uh, send the, our cor uh, corrections uh, to the device. And when we looked into the existing solution, we found uh, uh, in the, the ST kind of uh, ecosystem, the perfect uh, match to all what we needed. We, we used the Neclio STM32F7 to uh, be our MCU. Uh, we took the uh, Live3 uh, GNSS uh, module to uh, enable us to have access to raw data measurements. And we took the six axis IMU from ST uh, when we found out it's like the best uh, uh, performances for price that we can find out there, especially for IoT uh, uh, applications. Um, this is how our uh, um, uh, EV kit uh, looks like uh, in real life. And, um, and we found out that we also was really easy to build a, a custom shield that enable us to uh, change different uh, 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 modules that we need. One of them, for example, we're looking now into the TCO5 also for higher performances in some of, uh, uh, for some of our customers. And it makes it much easier to work and, and to change modules on existing uh, uh, shell. Um, this is our uh, uh, test uh, uh, scooter. As you can uh, see the red uh, uh, box on the bottom, this is the system and above it, obviously it's the, uh, our uh, Grand Truth system that uh, uh, enable us to understand the performances uh, of our system. Um, and on the right, you can see uh, uh, for, uh, results from San Francisco. Uh, over here, you weren't gonna, we, don't, we wouldn't be able to have a good Grand Truth system, but we use the map in order to like, uh, see the performances of our uh, uh, system. Uh, one interesting thing is that uh, um, a lot of uh, uh, DR, for example, for automotive using uh, map matching. Uh, we realized very fast that for scooters, you can really use uh, micro mobility, you can really use map matching because scooters can ride in, uh, against traffic in uh, small alleys on sidewalks and not necessarily riding on, on the road, which makes it uh, uh, more challenging for the DR and, and uh, if you use uh, uh, map matching. So we're not using map matching. Um, this in this slide you can see uh, results of uh, our test in a, in a standing uh, a scooter in a good, really good open sky uh, performances based on the uh, uh, Live 3 
uh, um, F uh, uh, receiver. Um, here you can see our test result in Santa Cruz, which is uh, uh, pretty much light, I would say, urban environment. And on the image, you can see that uh, the difference between the uh, uh, white uh, the white line, which is the uh, the GNSS uh, uh, with our corrections and, and DR, versus the yellow line, which is uh, what the GNSS uh, by itself uh, uh, performing. And uh, here you can see a test that we run in in San Jose. And uh, you can see how uh, uh, the ground truth is the white line, the green one is our solution, and the red one is how GNSS performing. And you can see that the big difference between uh, how GNSS performs versus uh, uh, our solution uh, uh, compared to that. Thank you very much uh, for your time and for listening. And I want to take this opportunity also to thank uh, the SC team for uh, you know the support uh, to build that. We needed a lot of uh, support and, uh, for the team, and uh, Mike and the team really helped us to do that. Uh, if you have any questions, we'll be happy to answer uh, on them now. Thank you.